In this video, I'm going to share five tips to get better audio quality in GarageBand on your iPhone or iPad. So let's go. Hi, my name is Pete and welcome to Studio Live today where my goal is to help you create, record and release your best music. And I do that through tips and tricks and tutorials just like this one. So if that's your bag, consider subscribing. Now, if you're short on time, jump in the description. I've got links to the five different tips. Feel free to jump around. There's also some links down there to all of the products that I'm going to mention in this video. Oh, and stick around to the end of the video because I've got a special secret number six tip that is really going to help you out, especially if you use microphones to record your vocals. Tip number one is to enable 24-bit audio resolution here in GarageBand. To do that, we come up to the top right and tap on the settings icon. We then come on down to advanced and tap on that one and then tap on this 24-bit audio resolution. There you go. That has now changed from 16-bit to 24-bit audio here in GarageBand. So what does enabling 24-bit audio actually do? Well, it gives you more bit depth, which means that if you've got especially quieter sounds, you're going to get more what we call dynamic range in your recordings, which means you'll be able to hear the detail of those quieter sounds. And 24 is just more and better than 16. So if you've got the ability to enable it, you might as well go ahead and do it. Now, 16-bit audio is actually still fine. In fact, it's what CD quality sound actually is, but 24-bit is better, especially if we're going to connect up some external devices to recording GarageBand, which is a good segue into our next tip, which is to use an audio interface to record your audio. So this is the Behringer Euphoria UM2. It's an entry-level audio interface, and this one is only 16-bit. The other audio interfaces that I recommend, like the Steinberg UR22C, the Focusrite Scarlett 2i2, are 24-bit interfaces. So that's the first thing to think about with an interface. But why should you use this over just the onboard sound or using another device to record in GarageBand? What an audio interface does is it takes your analog signals, your microphone or your guitar or your input, and it turns it into a digital signal that your iPhone or iPad or your Mac or PC can use. And it sends that out via USB as ones and zeros as a digital signal. So why it's important to have a good quality audio interface is twofold. It's the preamps or the quality of the inputs and the better quality interfaces have quieter and higher quality preamps. So that's going to give you a better quality sound. And the second is the converters. So once again, a better quality interface like this one, the Focusrite Scarlett 2i2 or the Steinberg UR22C that you can't see because I'm using it right now, that is going to give you a better analog to digital conversion. So you're going to get much higher quality audio when you plug in your microphones, your guitars, your keyboards, and your other devices into an audio interface. And once again, you can find links to these and all of the gear that I recommend down in the description. Tip number three is setting your input gain. Now, if you're using an audio interface, your input gain will be a knob on the actual interface itself, and you won't have any access to the input gain in GarageBand. However, if you're using some USB mics as well as the built-in microphone, you'll notice that we can actually change the input gain here using this input gain slider. Now, this is independent from the output gain. This is simply the volume that you'll hear in your track. It's nothing to do with the actual recording, but the input Input gain is very important to set correctly, and that's what we're going to show you now. Now, to demonstrate this, we're going to use the inbuilt microphone here on my iPad Pro. Now, some iPhones, for some reason, won't allow you to adjust the input gain, so you'll simply need to adjust how far or close you are to the microphone to get the right levels, because the input level is the important thing we're talking about here. So if we tap on this slider, if we bring this input gain all the way down, you can see here it's barely registering my voice. If we turn it too far up, you can see that we've started clipping our signal. Any time you're getting these red and orange dots up the top here, that is clipping your signal. So you want to set your input gain so that when you're talking normally, it is hitting around about 50%, up to about 70%. That's a little too high. We dial it down. That's still a little too high. Dial it down. That's about where you want it to be. So you want it to be around halfway when you're talking normally and when you're a bit louder, coming up to around about 70%. If it's too high, you're going to clip your signal, get distorted and bad quality sound. But don't just take my word for it. Let's do a quick test to show you what I mean. 
Now, again, I'm only using the built-in microphone, so the audio quality won't be great. But what I'll do is hit record, and I'll record in some audio with the meter at the right level. I'm then going to drop it down and then put it all the way up so that you can hear the difference and why you need to make sure that your input gain is dialed in correctly. This is recording at around about the right level. You can see that I'm sitting between about 50 and 70%. If I bring it down too low, then I'm not gonna get enough volume through in my sounds. And if I turn it up too high, well, yes, I'm gonna be clipping and distorting and I'm not gonna be sounding very good. Now that audio was just through my microphone here, but let's now play back the audio here from GarageBand so you can hear the difference between having the input gain set correctly as well as too low or too high. This is recording at around about the right level. You can see that I'm sitting between about 50 and 70%. If I bring it down too low, then I'm not going to get enough volume through in my sounds. And if I turn it up too high, well, yes, I'm going to be clipping and distorting and I'm not going to be sounding very good. Hopefully you can see and hear that getting your input gain dialed in correctly is super important for getting the best quality audio in your recordings. I want a quick additional mini tip here. If you are using the built-in mic and you're not happy with your audio quality, check out this plugin, Bruce Free by Clev Grant, a great noise reduction plugin. There's a link down in the description where you can check it out. Tip number four for better quality audio is to use EQ. Now EQ stands for equalizer or equalization. We've got an EQ built right in here to GarageBand that we can use to adjust our different frequencies. Now remember, EQ is just a volume control for a different frequency. So if you've got too much bass in your song, you can just reduce the bass down like that. If you've got too much mid range, that middle sort of nasally sounds and those muddy sounds, you can reduce that or increase them and the same here with your treble you can turn up or turn down the treble now the best thing to do to start with is to find the frequencies you don't like identify them by going side to side and then reducing them down by doing an eq cut you can also boost your eq if you want to hear more of a certain sound let's give you a quick demonstration on this vocal recording to show you some things we can do with eq so let's start with the bass. I'm going to hit play and then I'll show you what it will sound like if I reduce down the bass frequencies in my voice. Life doesn't have to be perfect, to be wonderful. Life doesn't have to be perfect. Now, in this case, the bass frequencies are pretty good, so I would leave it as it is. But if you've got a bass guitar or a bass kick drum or something that is too bassy, you can turn it down. You want to enhance it, yeah, just give yourself a nice little curve like that. You can use that. Let's now look at the mid-range. Now, this is something with vocals in particular that I tend to do because I've got a bit of a nasally voice, you might have noticed. So what I tend to do is find a tone around about 2,000 hertz where my nasalness comes through and see if we can reduce it. So let's hit play again. I'll I'll dial it up, find the tone that I want to remove, and then reduce it. To be wonderful, they say, but sometimes it feels that way. So there's the tone that I want. Let's come back and listen again and reduce it down and see if we can just take some of that nasal sound out of there. Life doesn't have to be perfect, to be wonderful. And as you see, you don't need to do big cuts or big jumps here. You can play around with it and experiment. The last one here is the treble sound. Now, this can be where you've got some sharp and harsh sounds in your, in your instruments. Maybe your guitar's too sharp and harsh. You can turn it down like that. Or with a vocal, you may want a little more what we call air, which is just that sort of unknown quantity that you have at the top there. So let's just play this again, and I'll uh, play around with the treble, and you'll hear the difference here. Life doesn't have to be perfect, to be wonderful. Life doesn't have to be perfect, to be wonderful, they say. So there you go. What I would do with this sort of vocal is I might have a little treble there to add some more air, remove that frequency there, probably do nothing with the bass. Now you can use this on any instrument on any track you like, and there's other EQ plugins that you can use as well. Another one called LRC, which I've got a video about linked up the top and down in the description. But EQ is a good technique to use. You don't need to use it on every track. Remember, listen first and then identify are there frequencies that you should be removing or adding in that are going to make your audio quality sound better. 
Tip number five is export quality. So the quality at which you export your final song from GarageBand can make a big difference, especially if you're using it on YouTube or creating videos with your song, you wanna make sure that it's uncompressed. So in order to share a song here in GarageBand, we're gonna tap in the top left to close out. We're gonna tap on the select button here in the top right and then select on our track. We're then gonna to go to the bottom left here, tap on share and share our song. Now, this is the important place. We need to ensure that we're not sharing as a compressed file. These are all compressed at different bit rates. They're not gonna be the best quality. What you want is an uncompressed WAV file. It's gonna be 44.1 kilohertz and 24 bit audio, which you learned about. We talked about that before. And it's just the most universally accepted format as well as the highest quality uncompressed format, which means no file compression is being applied. You you're going to maintain the highest possible quality audio. So to finish off, we just tap on share. That's going to open our share sheet. And then we also need to tap the open in button here in GarageBand. There's a little bit of a bug here at the moment. I wanted to show you that. That's going to export your song and we're going to save it to our file section. And then we can use this in any other project that we like. While that's exporting, a quick tip here and some information about why you need to do this. So file compression basically removes bits of the audio that you're not going to generally be able to hear, but it can actually degrade the quality of the audio. Now, the reason you don't want to compress here and now is that if you say put it into iMovie and then export as a compressed video, that is going to add compression. If you then upload it to YouTube or to Facebook, they will also add compression. So you want to keep your audio file uncompressed for as long as possible so that you get the best possible quality audio at the final stage. There you go, our song is exported, perfect version for audio recording and it's 62 megabytes. So your file sizes will be slightly bigger, especially if you've got 24-bit audio and a WAV file. Now, if you wanted to share this, we could, but we're gonna save it to the files here by tapping on that. If you wanna share it, use something like Google Drive or Dropbox because email and other instant messaging services, the file's gonna be too big for them. But there you go, when you're exporting, keep things uncompressed, you'll get the best sound. Bonus tip time, and that bonus tip is this, to use a pop filter, windscreen or windshield when recording, especially vocals or spoken word or anything where you may be popping your P's or putting S and W sounds into your microphone. Now, there's a few different ones we can use. There's something like this, which is just a foam windshield that goes over the top of your microphone. This protects in a pretty good way, and for something like this, a live stream or recording audio for a video, I use this. There's other options which we'll jump across and show you now. If you're using a condenser microphone, especially a large diaphragm condenser like this Audio-Technica AT2020, it is gonna pick up a lot of the definition and the quality of your audio, which means every time you get too close and pop your peas, you might get a popping sound. Now, something like this, a pop filter is going to help you. It comes on this little arm, you attach it to your stand, you put it in front, and that does a couple of things. It makes sure you maintain your distance from the microphone so you're not getting too close, and it actually prevents that because the popping peas or the plosive sounds, as we call them, are caused by the wind coming from your mouth. So when you go puh, you can put your hand in front, you can feel puh that that wind is coming through. Another technique is to move your head slightly to the side. It's still gonna pick up the audio, but you're not gonna be p popping in there. You can p p p go to the side and it's not quite as poppy. There's one more thing that I'll show you, which is in a dynamic microphone that can also help reduce your popping sounds. So if you're using something like this, an AKG D5 or a Shure SM57, you'll notice it has this grill, this metal cage that is gonna reduce some of those plosive sounds and those pops. It's also generally got some foam inside here. So if we open this up, there's the mic capsule. Inside there, you can't see it very well, but there is some of the soft foam similar to what we have on this windscreen. So you've kind of already got two levels of protection and that's done because often you'll use these for the stage or for live performances where you can't necessarily have a big pop filter in front of your, your face. So if you're using a microphone like this, and again, I've got all of these mics linked down in the description, make sure you have some sort of pop protection to get the best quality sound.